I'm Tanya with Black Lives Matter Sacramento. We're out here today to fight the system because it's guilty as hell. Um, we got the Brown Berets here. They're, they were here to do security and they still are. But at last minute we needed a DJ, so DJ Badass came out. So give him a shot of some props. He did that. Um, right now we're going to have our speaker, Tina Marie. How are you doing? I think it's beautiful that you all are out here today representing, you know, taking a stand. The whole system is guilty. Can I get an amen? amen. Can I get an amen? amen. That's right. Pedophile represent the city of Sacramento right now. Mayor Kevin Johnson is a sexual predator, and yet he's still holding office. We need to hold that. We need to hold our city accountable. You know, these politicians, they do whatever they want, and it really doesn't matter the color of your skin. Because at the end of the day, if you're thinking with a colonized mind, who are you advancing? The sheriff right now in Sacramento is ripping families apart. He's targeting Chicano, Latino, indigenous communities. People who are not worthy in his eyes of human rights. He's separating families every day, which is an international violation. This is an international law violation, a human rights violation. He's locking up mothers with their children based on bullshit paperwork. These people are indigenous to this land and they are due, you know, they are entitled to have the due process that they are entitled to for their own human rights. The same sheriff has not given a police report to the family of Adrian Ludd, who was murdered on October 22nd. 2015 how would you feel if your family was not given a police report on their murder at the hands of the police department this is a systematic problem that expands past the local level the police are protected by the police bill of rights they have the discretion to kill if they feel threatened they have an armed license to kill. Think about that. They're not even required to have a bachelor's degree. What type of education? <laughs> what type of education? I'm sorry. You know what I mean? Like, really? These people have guns. They have the discretion to say, you know what? I feel threatened by you. I'm going to kill you. I'm going to take your life. And I don't have to answer to anybody. They're not subject to take any type of drug test at all. So you have these police officers running around, raping women, killing people, killing our sons, killing our daughters, and they're, collect they're protected by the government. They don't have to give blood or urine samples. I'm not sure how many of y'all know that, but they are protected by the law. That's a problem. This is a systematic violation, and this is a genocide. This is a genocide happening on our lands. I do want to thank Tanya from Black Lives Matter for inviting us out today to do security, music, you know, <laughs> hold it down on the mic just to have everybody come out and really talk about issues that are going on on a local level. You know, there's there's just so many. It's just, it's sickening how many there are. And it's, it's honestly disgusting and disheartening that we have to keep coming out here, you know, day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year. It's kind of like how many how many times do we have to deal with this shit, you know? I, I really feel like if these politicians can't learn how to cross their T's and dot their I's, they need to get the fuck up out of office because they're not representing the people, you know? We need a system for the people, by the people, and that is not what we have right now. So what we need to do, we need to break the system. When I say break the, you say system. Break the, system. break the, system. when I say break the, you say system. Break the, system. break the, system. when I say break the, you say system. Break the, system. break the, system. when I say break the, you say system. Break the, system. break the, system. do for the youth, on Mateo. So just to elaborate more on Adrian Ludd, um, he's who Black Lives Matter Sacramento has been fighting for for the last almost six months. His family, he was killed by the Sacramento Sheriff. The story has changed I think three times. Um, he has not, his family has not gotten a police report. They haven't gotten an autopsy report. Um, we do know based on some information that 
was pried by the family is that he was shot in the back of the head and in his back, which is, that means he was running or going the other way. So um, I just want to highlight that we're still fighting for Adrian Ludd. I hope that you continue to join us in our fight because we are going to be up in the ante. Um, next, we have a speaker named Jordan. He's representing Black Lives Matter Sacramento. How y'all doing? Hey, hey. You know, it's 2016, everything's on your phone, so I'll speak to my phone. The title of this is The Whole System is Guilty, right? The whole system is guilty, or is it? For the system to be guilty, we must prove it has wronged us, prove it has harmed us in a way so bad as it deserves to be held accountable for its actions. For the system to be guilty, we must be valued as equal members within the structure of the system. The very definition of a system states a set of connected things or parts forming a complete complex whole, or better yet, a set of principles or procedures according to something in which something is done in organized scheme or method. For the system to be guilty, we must have been a part of those principles and procedures to start with, right? For those of you who forgot, or maybe you only learned what the public education system taught you, it's curriculum we were never a part of, that we were never supposed to be part of those principles. The education system, the prison system, and the justice system were not formed protecting those with melanin in mind. To be quite blunt, they were founded to maintain a hierarchy of power. The war on drugs was established to destroy the black family, rip the father out the home, just as in slavery. The system was designed like that. The education system was forced to accept kidnapped Africans into their schools, and so they taught us to hate ourselves, and how our history began with slavery to belittle us. The system was designed like that. The justice system even told us that Africans were three-fifths of human beings, and that even more so, anyone who was with African descent could never be a citizen in the wilderness that's called the United States. And we wonder why we see genocide in our communities. The system was designed like that. In, is the system guilty? I would rather argue the opposite. The system is doing exactly what it's designed to do. These systems will never give you the equality they tell you that King won, or even that they promised with their fancy words and documents, because these systems weren't speaking about you. It's time to create our own systems through the $1.1 trillion in black buying power. $1.1 trillion would rank blacks in the United States as the 16th most powerful country in the world. It's time to bank black, buy black, invest black, and build black. The system was designed against you, so instead of trying to be included where you're not seen as equal, why haven't we begun to unify and build what we want? I'll leave you with this from Masada Shakur. Okay. Nobody in the world, nobody in history, has ever gotten their freedom by appealing to the moral sense of the people who were oppressing them. Right. Once you understand the system was not designed with us in mind, you'll then be able to understand how to create our freedom. Thank you. Speaking of black land ownership, um, we've also been fighting gentrification. I don't know if you guys have been to Oak Park lately, or if you've been there in the past and then been there again lately. <laughs> it's um, The demographics have changed extremely in Oak Park. It used to be a very, it's still a lot of poverty there, um, but it was mostly people of color that live there, mostly black. Um, our mayor has taken it and flipped it and renovated it and invested in it and developed it and bought blocks at a time. And now um, we have problems with newcomers that are calling the police on people that have lived there for a long time. Um, people are being criminalized. People are being paid to move out of their apartments. The prices of business uh, renting or leasing the office space for businesses has gone up and so people are forced to take their businesses and leave people that have businesses that have been there for like over 10 years. Broadway Soul Food Takeout, that was one of the places I went to in high school. They had to raise their, they had to pay more money within like two weeks or else they had to leave and it was way out of their reach so they're no longer there anymore. And then you have businesses coming in from like Arizona, 
um, white owned businesses that are hiring white people and they're serving stuff that's too expensive for people of color in those communities to afford. So um, with that being said, also um, CB Circle, New Helvetia is one of the places that's in the future, they're supposed to be being torn down to build townhomes for this new arena. And so that's going to displace all the people that live there. They say that they're bringing 50% of the people back and they're pushing this new jobs thing. And I think that's, you know, I mean, this is just my personal opinion. They're pushing jobs to make it so that they can push these people out and say, hey, we got them jobs. But that's my opinion. Um, we have someone here today who's living in New Helvetia. She's been witnessing all the different things that Sacramento Housing and Redevelopment has been trying to do. And she wants to come and tell her story today. Renita. Hello, um, my name is Renita Williams. I'm a Sacramento native and a resident of Alder Grove. What I'm about to say is going to be a little sugar coated because I've gotten a lot of attention from SHRA and I want to keep my lease in short. Um, my apartment complex, which was previously New Habitation, which is now Alder Grove, and its sister community, Marina Vista, they're going through a transformation. While everything looks beautifully constructed on paper, um, sorry, maybe I should have had it on my phone. Uh, <laughs> the residents of Alder Grove and Marina Vista are gonna be at a huge disadvantage when the bulldozers come. Me and my five-year-old daughter are gonna be at a huge disadvantage when the bulldozers come. The goal is to renovate, rebuild, and relocate almost every unit there in CV Circle in New Havisha. They'll be adding mixed income housing into a place where there's not enough low income housing and placing the low income housing in emergency housing while criminalizing the people sleeping outside that don't have housing at all. Unfortunately, that makes no sense to me, but it makes a lot of sense to them and it's gonna be very beautiful when the Serena's built and you know, it's within sight of it. When a bike is stolen or a car is vandalized, the finger will be pointed at the poor. Adding a group of Zimmermans to a neighborhood full of Trayvon Martins will start a trend of justified slayings and we all have a front row seat to it. This is affecting the unborn, the elders, the black, the white, and everyone in between that live in those apartments because poverty sees no color and it sees no age. While management is bridging the communication gap, it can't wash the stereotypes of these neighborhoods away. When you're looking at that place that's labeled as ghetto, of course you're gonna wanna change it and do stuff to it but in actuality people are living there just to get by it's transitional housing we're trying to find better for ourselves and i ruffled a lot of feathers with shra within the last week and you know their departments that are just close to the residents it's garbage and they they're just trying to bring us down and we're trying to come up you know, the programs are beautiful, but they are trying to get us out. And people are, they don't have the hope to stand up for themselves. This turnout is beautiful, but as stated before, tell 10 friends and tell those 10 friends to bring 10, fair, 10, fr 10 friends, excuse me. Because if we can't speak for ourselves, we're all gonna be screwed when the bulldozers come. Because even though he's not after your neighborhoods right now, he will be when he's done with us. Thank you. after that except for that we have Professor Andrea Moore from Sac State. She's coming to um, give us some information, some knowledge. Give a hand to Aunt Professor Moore. Hello everyone. I'm glad to see all of your faces. As Tanya stated, I am Andrea Moore and I am here standing before you not just as a professor from Sacramento State, but I stand before you as a mother of a three-year-old son, a daughter of I'm a mother of two daughters, age 20 and 17. Um, I am relatively new to Sacramento, um, about two years now. I am from the Bay Area by way of Dallas, Texas. And 
when I look out in this crowd, what I see are the seeds of the legacies of the organizations and the activist organizers who came before you on this very space. The Brown Berets are in the house. Do we know who the Brown Berets are? Do we understand that they come from a history of a group of people who wanted to police the police? They came from a group of people who had to deal with infiltration in their organization to try and tear them down from the outside. They are allies, historical allies, to the Black Power and the Black Panther movement, but they still stand here with their berets on, with their brown on. When I look out, I'm wondering, well, where are Black Panthers? They're here. Where are our seeds from SNCC, from SCLC, from CORE, from all of the young organizations that were started by young people who wanted to get active in what was going on in their communities. My question that I have for everybody here is I've been talking to a few different people is, why are you here? Why are you here today? Are you here because you are supposed to report back what you heard was going on? Are you here because you are act actually invested and affected by the issues displayed before you are in front of these steps? We saw tons and tons of young people behind us. And I'm thinking, oh, they're gonna be a part of what's happening. But we're living in a time period where you can be standing right in the back of the chaos that is happening in your community, and you can just stand that way with your back turned towards it. And not come over here and see what is being said. The young people were here, obviously for something. A couple of people turned around and looked, but no one stayed. And it's the very young people that we need present at informationals just like this. Again, I remind you that you are the seeds of the legacies who came before you. You are part of history in the making. I've been working with Tanya trying to figure out how can we, uh, on an institutional level, who is still a part of that same system, you know, that's guilty of providing this master narrative, find a way to penetrate that institution and find a way to make that college institution do what it claims it does, and that support marginalized communities and underrepresented students. And so I stand before you here today to say, that is what I'm here for, to try to work with her, to see how we can, again, bring heart organization into our institution, bring it into the classrooms, create trainings and workshops around educating people about social awareness. And again, I say to you, why are you here? Why are you here today? Make sure you share that with somebody because maybe you two can help each other out. We're again, living in a time period where we don't necessarily even have to communicate with each other as human beings. We can just you know, communicate through our devices. But while we're here, meet somebody, talk to somebody, ask them, why are they here? What brings them here? What brings them here? Again, you are a seed of the legacy of those who came before you. 20 years from now, they're gonna be talking about insight to insight. They're gonna still be talking about the Brown Berets. They're still gonna be talking about the Black Lives Matter. It is a child of the movements that came before. So use your position to help affect the change that brought you here today. Is here, a very, very good man. His name is Mario Galvan. Um, he's going to speak to us for a moment. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to answer the question that uh, was just posed to us. You know, why am I here? Uh, I'm here because uh, for Many years, uh, more than I can remember, you know, I've been fighting for uh, justice, uh, you know, equality uh, against this uh, system that uh, values money more than human beings. Um, you see from my shirt that I'm uh, wearing the Zapatista Coalition uh, colors here. And uh, <laughs> uh, we have a couple of our fellow Zapatista Coalition members over here too. And, uh, but, um, you know, with the issue here of Black Lives Matter being primarily concerned with police brutality, I want to just link this struggle that is happening here in the United States 
to what I'm sure you've all heard about uh, with the 43 students from Ayotzinapa in Mexico who were also uh, uh, murdered by police. Uh, and it, as it turns out from the latest news, uh, you know, the, the story they gave about how the police handed these kids over to a gang of drug uh, dealers uh, to be murdered and the bodies disposed of is turning out to be false. It turns out that uh, it was the police all the way with, uh, from uh, the, not only the state police in Mexico, but the federal police and yeah, even the Mexican military, which if you know the history of Mexico shouldn't surprise you because of course the Mexico went through a whole dirty war period in the 70s where uh, 30,000 people were uh, killed, disappeared. The bodies were never found. Uh, they actually just put the, they would drug people and they would put them in planes and fly them out to sea and throw them out of the plane. Uh, this is uh, the beautiful government of Mexico that the, our United States government supports. And, uh, you know, the, the struggle for justice in Mexico is going on against uh, police brutality that is so horrific that over a hundred thousand people have been killed in the last six years, murdered six, seven years. And uh, in terms of disappeared, they're pushing like 40,000 people disappeared. We're, you know, we're talking about 43 students now, but the total number is, you know, it, it, last time I heard a couple of years ago was 35,000 people disappeared. I want to just transition from that a little bit, you know, just to to, to, to show you that that struggle that we have uh, against state brutality is not just happening here in the United States. It's a global phenomenon. You know, the, the elite groups in each country that govern, you know, the U.S. elite backs the elite in Mexico and in Colombia and in Honduras, you know, where Berta Caceres was just murdered uh, recently. The, Honduran activist working against the dam that's pushing her people out of their uh, ancestral home. Uh, and the gunman just broke into her house and uh, just shot her down. Um, again, this is uh, this is the, in, under the coup government that it was supported by the United States. You know, when they uh, threw out their elected president. Uh, and uh, all of the countries of Latin America and many countries around the world condemned that coup. Guess who stepped in to back them up? Hillary Clinton and Uncle Sam here. The United States government stepped in and said, oh no, we recognize these guys, these are good people, etc." Um, I'm, <laughs> I'm afraid of talking too much and at the same time I'm afraid of not saying enough. You know, just, to, just in a nutshell, the, the type of things that we see happening in this country with the, you know, the working class being destroyed, unions being run down, in Honduras, under the new government, they have this program called Model Cities, where if you can believe it, a, con a company comes in and they're, they're given this territory where the laws of the c c c government of Honduras don't apply. The company can make up their own laws in, in their own area. So they can uh, violate any uh, environmental laws, any labor laws. Imagine if you, I've, uh, I, and I got this straight from a, a couple of years ago, a couple of members of the Honduran government were here, the opposition government, of course. Uh, they were brought in by the Sacramento Labor Council, and I was able to interview them in their hotel room. Uh, and they're telling me about, like, people who have worked for a company for 20 years already, and then the company fires them and hires them back part-time, and they lose their whole pension, they lose their job security, etc. This is... This is the this is the freedom and democracy we're being uh, bringing to uh, Honduras, and uh, as you probably know, you know, the I think Uncle Sam is a little little getting a little desperate to do something like this because more and more governments in Latin America are pulling away from the U.S. You know, they're creating their own, they're trying to create their own banks, the ALBA, the the Alliance of Bolivar Bolivarian Nations. You know. Uh, and so Uncle Sam is, you know, he's putting the pressure on, you know, they're, uh, they've got that trying to overthrow Dylan Rousseff in uh, Brazil and they're, uh, uh, they uh, kind of overthrowing the government of Venezuela and uh, Honduras and all that's going on. So again, um, let me come back to Mexico, okay, that's just, uh, sorry I digress. 
But I, I wanted to point out that something that really was uh, struck me in Mexico, and of course during the elections in Mexico, there was a time uh, back in like 2006, 2007, when the Zapatista struggle was going on in Mexico. Now, if you don't know about the Zapatistas in a nutshell, they rose up in arms. They actually just got sick of trying to petition the government and they created an army. They rebelled. And it, again, can't tell the whole story, but today the Zapatistas control uh, a huge area of, of the state of Chiapas, Mexico. They run their own government. They elect their own officials. There's no state government over them. There's no federal government over them. They are autonomous, they say, down there. And uh, they're building everything by themselves. They take no, they get no aid from the government. Uh, and uh, But they do get attacked by the government because, the, you know, the government, as governments do, it, uh, in public it says, oh, we approve of what you're doing and uh, you have the right to do that. And then at the same time, they fund groups to attack the Zapatistas. So the last time I was in Zapatista territory uh, last year, <laughs> Uh, I was at a school that was rebuilt because it had been attacked by a paramilitary group. Uh, the school and the clinic were burned down. The teacher in that community was killed. Uh, and uh, even even then, the the people who were responsible for the killing were, uh, were back in town. They were walking around, going, "Ah, well, we're free. Yeah, so what? See, we well, can get away with this." Um, but the, the the point I'm come, trying to come to, and let me finish is that in, in, back at this time in 2006, there was a fraudulent election where Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador ran for president and he was defeated by a fraudulent election. And uh, they, they had a protest. In fact, if you can imagine Mexico City, one of the, the city of like 24 million people, they set up uh, like barricades through the, through the streets of the city. They actually kind of divided the city almost in half in the downtown. And there were like tents and people from all over Mexico from different states came to demand a recount in the election. It was amazing. Uh, uh, but so there was this whole movement of, uh, you know, calling out the fraud, which has been repeated many times in Mexican politics. At the same time, in the state of Oaxaca, the teachers, uh, there was a whole uprising there over uh, the, the teachers who were on strike. I don't know if you guys know that a teacher, an average teacher in Mexico makes about $200 a month. That's their salary. And uh, on the trip when I was down there last year, I, I was hanging with some teachers who were on the trip that we went down to the Zapatista community. And one of them was telling me, I said, so um, what's it like to be a teacher in Mexico? Uh, you know, uh, and, she, uh, and she was talking about how the they have to struggle for hours like when you go through college and you get your teaching credential in mexico you don't come out and you get like we do in the united states you get a, a job hopefully uh, you know you get a full-time job I, I was a high school teacher i just retired a couple of years ago and um you know i had, had you know got a full-time job etc she told me that a teacher in mexico when they start and they come out of college and they get their first job they're lucky if they get half time and then every year, she says, there's a thing they call the chain of hours, the, where the, the teachers with seniority retire, and the hours that they have go down the chain. So the, the person with the most seniority can pick those hours up. He says, well, if I want to take that job, I can take that, et cetera. So the hours trickle down. They come down through the chain, down, 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 down. And so I, said, I finally said, so how long does it take someone to get a full-time job in, uh, as a teacher in Mexico? <laughs> And she says it might take 20 years before, before. So a lot, you know, a lot of these teachers are doing, working other jobs and everything. So the point I'm trying to make is here, and, and I, I asked myself this question. And I asked people in Mexico this. I said there were simultaneously three massive movements going on in Mexico at, against the government. There were the Zapatistas in Chiapas. There were the teachers and the whole organization of the community that came out to support them in Oaxaca. And there were the Manuel Lopez Obrador people occupying the city of Mexico. And incidentally, his party was controlled the city. They had the mayor of Mexico City, which is how they got away with it. And my question was, why couldn't these three forces combine and to create one great force that had a chance to topple the government? And that's what I would like to ask us today is, 
why are we separated and struggling in this movement and that movement and that movement when together it will be our only chance of, uh, of making the changes that we need to do. And we need to make them in the government. We need to take over the government. We need to change the laws to change what's happening. And that's what I'm trying to do with my candidacy for Congress. And uh, if anyone wants to talk to me about it more, I've had some uh, literature here in my bag and uh, I think I've talked a little too much as it is. Anyway, thank you very much. And I'm very proud to be here and uh, victory to the people. For those of you that are here, we're going to be at the city council tonight. Um, they're having a meeting still, right? Because they cancel all the time at the last minute mm -hmm. for no reason. But if you want to have your voice heard on any of these issues, or if you've had any of these experiences that people have talked about, please come to city council and make your voice heard every Tuesday. Um, what time? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm Six. Six. PM. And they get away with bullshit every week because nobody shows up. Keep them on track. You want to talk? No. <laughs> Just show up, please, for real, because they're not going to do anything if people don't show up and tell them what they're doing is wrong. All right. Use it. <laughs>